All right, guys, continuing on with the uh, Haller Hustle haul from uh, August of 2014. Now we're into the boxes that I got down in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, I believe. There's a Memorial Day, Day sale going on. I really don't remember what the name of the store was, but it is huge. It's one of the stores where he had used books, comics, uh, uh, just all kinds of stuff, movies, DVDs, statues, and everything like that. It was a really uh, huge store that if you went through it, I could probably get through it in two days if I did it right and stuff. And that place was packed. And basically what it was is that he had a sale going on where you got a long box of comics. Depending on uh, how old your long box is, it could hold anywhere from 300 to 350 comics. Uh, no tell, you know, I'm assuming that's what's bags and boards and stuff. Those do take up a lot of space. And, uh, you know, and, and you pay, you know, whatever you could put in the box out of his dollar boxes. Um, and he had a ton of them. We went through 72 boxes, uh, me and my buddy Tim. And I thought we were slowing down because of the tables. And Tim did the math, like I said, probably in the first video of, uh, you know, this little playlist here. But, like, uh, you know, in three hours, I was like, man, I didn't feel like I really went through anything. And he, he did the math. We did 72 boxes probably a few more because at the 15 minute mark I started flying through the rest of the boxes that were against the wall on these tables and they went from one end of the wall to the other no telling how many boxes were there I mean I know it was over 40 at least so this guy had a ton 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 of dollar boxes well anyway Tim uh, my buddy Tim I filled my box up and I had some stuff to the side where I was picking and choosing stuff still left some stuff behind and he just he just did not fill his box up so I probably got about at least a minimum of I don't know 50 to 100 more comics I guess because he let me put them in his box and real nice of them so this is the indie stuff this is the spillage okay there's still a long box to go but this is the indie stuff uh, we're going back to the 80s the 90s and I think there's like maybe a mini series in here so so let's get started there because I don't want these videos to be very long okay so I'm just pulling them out of the box over here First thing we got, and I know there's some doubles in here, but I'm still not going to chance it and stuff like that. Tons of Madman comics by Mike Allred. And, uh, you know, Madman's been around for quite a while now. It really blows my mind how old he is and stuff. I think he started off as a three-issue miniseries at Tundra. There we go. Oh, that one's kind of, okay. Kind of a zany little zippy character and stuff. Uh, and for you guys who watched cartoons in the 90s, there was uh, a show called Freakazoid, and Freakazoid is an out-and-out, out, I think it has pictures on the back covers. Freakazoid was an out-and-out out plagiarism of Mike Allard's Madman, to the point that, you know, legend has it that Bruce Timm actually talked with uh, Mike Allard, who does Madman, and said that it was a direct inspiration. Um, and he was all flattered and stuff, and the more he thought about it, and the more he saw the cartoon, you know, supposedly writing a letter to Steven Spielberg, saying, I'm not going to cause ripples, I just want you to know that I know that you guys ripped me off. And, uh, you know, but Mike Allard also has this thing where Madman is influenced by so many characters and stuff, who's he to really say anything? So, yeah, these also have back covers, but we always say, but yeah, real nice run of Madman. Zippy, little strange comic uh, Frank Einstein he had died in a car wreck and the scientists had kind of put them together and if you put say his name together it makes Frankenstein but it's Frank Einstein and he had his little quirky little loves and he had little heroes and he used a yo-yo uh, you know, as a weapon if you will and made bad jokes you know just really good stuff really good stuff if you want something different first smashing issue when a return from Atomic Comics so yeah, I'm really glad to get these. Um, you know, ah, oh, here's a wraparound cover. Yeah, good stuff. All nice glare there, Mullins. Love this cover. You know, what is that? David Bowie, Aladdin, Insane, I think. Very nice, very nice. In the Moth, Steve Rude's The Moth. That's cool. And there you go. All right, so that's the Madman. Then I found this. I had never heard of this, right? <coughs> I'm a Frank Thorne fan. And Frank Thorne had to have been like in his mid-50s when he did this. He uh, did Red Sonja in the 70s. Um, I'm trying to think how old the guy was. I think he was like born in 1930 or something like that. So Frank, 
Thorne had been around for a while doing uh, some stuff in the 50s. can't really remember what he did, but he ended up like working for Playboy and stuff, and then he did Red Sonja uh, at uh, DC in the late 70s. And then he comes out with this, Ribbit, from Comico. No idea what it is. I think he did some porn comics for a company called Eros. Mm, you know, I don't know. I'm going by memory here, but... Uh, you know, here we go. We have a girl who I assume is half lizard or a frog, I guess, on a skateboard with a gun with big 80s hair. So, you know, you talk about a man who had his pulse, you know, on the 80s. I just can't wait to read that. I think this is a double, but it's one of the original Doc Horse Comics Presents with uh, Sin City in it. The first uh, Sin City story that was just called Sin City didn't get a name uh, until... The first movie came out, The Hard Goodbye. I saw Sin City 2 about when it came out, and it was awful. I mean, the first one's a classic. Awful. This one was awful. I think I described it as a hard, hard white, dried-up dog turd. You know. Um, and then we ended up with uh, more Cerebus, man. I mean, I am just racking up the Cerebus here lately, you know. I'll probably end up getting these in phone books anyway, man. So, uh, there's no use in doing the numbers, but, uh, you know, I would guess we'll head. Here's number 70. Some of the kind of earlier she's 64 you know I was really surprised to get these you know 190 uh, 191 and I'm assuming these are first prints while he was doing the world tour so uh, 193 Cerebus ran for 300 issues and he did mean it to be the life story of one character 195 a lot of changes I remember he said that he probably went 50 issues too long if he had just known what he was doing he would have ended it at uh, Issue 250, 196. Ended up talking about religion and men. Started out as a Conan parody. Had Red Sophia as Red Sonya. And had a character that I loved that was like Elric. You know, I think his name was Elrod. But he talked like uh, Foghorn Leghorn in the books. You know, I never got offended, you know, with that southern draw that he was probably, you know, making fun of. 198, 199. And what was really a bummer about this is that, uh, you know, his wife helped run uh, the company while he was publishing this. What would they call it? Aardvark or something. And they got went through a divorce and all this stuff. And he really got, uh, he got, he, he got accused of being a mis um, he hated women, misogynist, 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 misogynist. I always mess up my words when I'm on camera. But anyway, he, he uh, you know, he had a, a prediction get told to, uh, uh, you know, his fortune told to Cerebus that he's going to die alone and unloved. Just really put a bummer on it and stuff. So that, you know, you kind of saw what happened in issue 300. But he also started putting out little, uh, little uh, articles and, you know, little editorials, I think, in the beginning or the back of uh, the Cerebus books. And he got into a lot of controversy because he compared women and men, men is the light, and women is the black hole that sucks the light, you know, and just destroys it or something. <coughs> Weird guy, but the guy also supposedly went to an after party, I don't know, a convention or something, and like Peter David was there, and Dave Sim was there, and a whole bunch of other people were there, and they were having virgin drinks, which means there was no alcohol, and Dave Sim acted like he was all drunk and raising hell and stuff, so, you know, strange guy, strange guy. We all go through different phases in life. All right, now, a lot of people a few months ago were talking, and it's kind of wild because it's like every time they announce a movie or a TV show, that book gets hot until the next one. That's what I've been seeing. Preacher got announced. Everybody wanted Preacher. That number one shot up to being worth about $300. Then another book. And then Howard the Duck popped up in Guardians of the Galaxy. But right before that, they announced a Dreadstar movie by Jim Starlin. And everybody, you know, went crazy and nuts for Dreadstar for a little bit. I don't know if people are still hunting this shit or not, okay? But I found a whole bunch of uh, Dreadstar. When it moved from Epic to First Comics, or maybe it was at First Comics and went to Epic, I don't know. I didn't do, I didn't research this. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to do the numbers and stuff, but, I mean, it's got a whole bunch of Dreadstar. So I finally get to sit down and see what all the hubbub is, because honestly, you know, as much as I like Jim Starlin and stuff, I just never really got into Dreadstar. I remember I read a few like an Epic magazine or something. I had a Marvel graphic novel back in the 80s, which I refound a couple months ago. And I've always kind of wondered what Jim Starlin looked like in the 80s and if he drew himself as the main character. You know. But, you know, heavy sci-fi, far, 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 far future, I think. 
Um, here we go. We're back in the epic line now. You know, cat people and I mean, there's people that really, really, you know, dug it. I remember they would read it and indie books back in the day really blew my mind because like they felt like indie books. They 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 were odd and quirky and you know the artwork was just a little bit off and stuff. Even when it was like you know name name guys and from the big two Marvel and DC doing them and stuff like that. But I think what it was is a lack of commercialism. And they really were indie books. You know, they were doing different things, more adult themes, weird things. I uh, always had the idea that maybe these guys were listening to some wild music and smoking a little dope. You know, yeah, that's a classic cover. That, that's that's so Star Wars it just blows my mind. Even though I don't ever see a seen that. Yeah, the end. Did he die? And Jim Starlin always inserted, you know, little things about religion and suicide and stuff. I mean, he. Uh, he would make his books definitely have a feel to them because he would just insert some kind of real world grimness, I guess is the word, you know, into these four color pages and stuff. Which is one of the things about how he got by with so much stuff in Warlock. This blew my mind. I mean he, he turned Adam he turned him, Adam Warlock, sort of into an allegory for Jesus and stuff and you know, this is the seventies and you know. Yeah, more great star. Just all kinds of cool stuff. So yeah, I got a little bit of reading to do and stuff. So you know, I'll be staying home a lot this month, gladly looking at these books and stuff. All right, and moving on, about halfway through the books. Now, I told you guys I'd be talking a lot about the elementals, okay? And the first appearance of the elementals was in a book called Justice Machine, but it was a Justice Machine annual. No idea what the Justice Machine is, and I can't believe I've been finding so much Comico. <coughs> Back in the late 80s, I ended up buying two books, man. You know, we had the spinner racks in, in my town, where you got your Daredevil, your Superman, your Batman, your Justice League. Then we ended up at the mall up in Bluefield, which, you know, back then was like just quite the trip. You know, that was like only 45, 50 minutes up the road. And you walk into a bookstore, and the bookstore had two spinner racks that were made of plastic and stuff, and they had all these books I never heard of. And I ended up getting our Elementals, I think, number three, the same day that I got Sandman number five. You know, so those were like the oddities in my collection at the time. Both were pretty weird and felt whoops, felt pretty hardcore about things. But anyway, apparently I think this was a mini series, and this is number one, Justice Machine starting the Elementals. And I think in my last video I was telling you about Bill Willingham. Uh, he started out, I did look it up after I was doing it by memory. Here's Elementals number one of their ongoing series. I think they had three volumes. But um, and here's the bad guys, you know. But from what I can tell, this evil scientist, number two, this evil scientist had tried to take control of the elements or something of the world, and the world retaliated in order to bring balance back. So they each got like an avatar or, a, you know, a hero, if you will, of people who had died from an element. Okay, so Fathom was a lady who died from water. I think she fell off a boat. Um... Vortex, who is of air, you know, he, I think he suffocated somehow. Uh, the one who becomes rock, I can't remember his name. I think he died in an avalanche or something. And then you had uh, Morningstar Fire, who was like this homicide detective who, uh, you know, got burned to death, if you get what I'm saying. So, uh, you know, they had a lot going on. And they had that big, bad band. Here's number 10. You know, see what I'm saying about the indie thing? You know, this is going in there. But Bill Winningham started out, like, drawing... Uh, in TSR books for Dungeons and Dragons and I think he did his own Villains and Vigilantes. Now these are all wraparound covers so I apologize for not showing them but I don't want to make a super long video. So uh, yeah. Vortex. And there's the vampire. From what I can tell there really is just one vampire in the world and that's why I'm really interested. You know that is an indie looking character. You know not real marketable if you will. Uh, there he is. Getting ready to fight Fathom. So that's really interesting. Then there's Rat Boy in here. And you know, there's a play on Batman, Bat Boys, and all that stuff. But Rat Boy was actually pretty cool in this. I'm hoping he's on a cover somewhere. But I heard this was a very. Uh, it, this, this is a, definitely a series that had like a, a touch of darkness to it. So, you know, we'll see what's going on there. Here's the bad guys. Yeah, and there's our elementals. So, you know, oh, got some doubles. Looks like Tim Anderson's going to get some. So this is awesome to get ah, more doubles. We're up in the 20s now. Sorry I'm going so fast, but yeah. 
Oh, looks like they're going up against a bunch of monsters and medieval stuff. And I think we're into volume two now. And I saw number one to volume two, and I thought I already had it, and so I missed out on that one. But they also had some specials. That is their version of Thor and the Oblivion War. Uh, apparently it was a pretty good arc in there. But this is their version of Thor, and he popped up quite a bit. So it'll be interesting to see what he does. You know. Uh, just some, that, that cover's pretty good. Look at the back cover of that one. Yeah, not bad. Looks like they were slowly sort of updating them. So, this is all good. You know, and I think, uh, the Suicide and one of the Elementals turned into a bad guy. Excuse me. There we go. Oh, okay, we got some stuff in here from DC a little bit that popped in here. There's some stuff from Marvel, but that's okay. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I'm trying to get War of the Gods, even though it's kind of weak. Uh, and, you know, George Perez did the layouts and he wrote this. <coughs> Basically, it was the Roman gods versus the Greek gods. And Captain Marvel slash Shazam and Wonder Woman kind of took center stage. And they had pinups in them. And there's all kinds of little crossovers. But, you know, it's kind of weak. Uh, George Perez did his layouts really small. This is what I have to do a little bit of research for to make sure I have all the issues or close to it. This is Empire by Mark Wade, And I've always wanted to kind of check this story out because it has an Astro City feel. It's the story told from a different point of view, this being the villain. And that's what Astro City does. You know, it takes other characters and we see, you know, the comic book world from their point of view, not just the hero and stuff. But this one, this is the one where the villain finally took over the world and we see what a villain would do when he took over the world and from what I understand he was like why the hell did I do this you know from what I understand he was like it's a lot of responsibility and you gotta watch your back all the time so there's zero uh, and I'm not gonna go into the history of it I got a pretty good idea it seems like it is you know I don't know I'm, I know this is DC Comics but I'm kinda wondering if he took it elsewhere like this you know here's the image so you know Empire returned or maybe this is where it started out but yeah, this was stuff that was just not on the shelves. There's the DC number one. Barry Kinson did it. Mark Waite did the art. Mark Waite did, you know, did everything. So, yeah, I'm real curious about reading these. Pretty good run there. Okay. And then here's some Marvel Max books. And it was really funny because I just decided to go back and try to get these. I had like the first 12 or something. I got rid of them, then I found, you know, two, four, six, you know, here and there, scattered, and then here they all were. I think I got a number one somewhere. Here I just said here they all are, and I don't know. <coughs> okay, that's volume two. Okay, they came out with two volumes of this. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. But uh, you'll notice when you see it, need this fail, so they're going to be out of order. But anyway, Supreme Power by J. Michael Straczynski, where... They took the Squadron Supreme, who is more or less Marvel's version of the Justice League, and they put him in, in a max line, free of all the continuity stuff, and there's some pretty brutal stuff in this, man. I mean, this is like, you know, sophisticated for adults. And you know what sophistication means? You know, sex and boobies and cruelty and all this stuff. That's off spectrum number two, number three. But uh, I think Gary Frank came in here and did the artwork, and he did a phenomenal job. Straczynski and Gary Frank have done quite a few things. Uh, turned uh, Nighthawk into a uh, man of color there. And, uh, you know, we got, um, oh man, what was his name? Good God, I'm one blank. And I love these guys. The Wizard? Yeah, turned the Wizard into kind of a Booster Gold-like character. And they slowly started finding each other. And, you know, that's their version of uh, their Aquaman. <laughs> the Amphibian turned her female, you know took away that Dr. Spectrum costume which I loved you know so Supreme Power is what it was called and uh, Princess Power and Hyperion became a couple and the government's involved and you know race is involved and, you know just some you know kind of like what if they were in the real world you know in the max so it's explicit you know then I think we're in the volume two here getting ready yeah so there's all those. Sorry I'm going so quick, but I think you get the point. Alright. And the next one here. Global Frequency. This is, I think, I don't know much about this. This came out through Wildstorm, but this is Warren Ellis. 
uh, I think it's a 12 issue miniseries. Yeah. One, four, I don't have them all. I'm missing like maybe one issue. But Global Frequency, I heard a lot of people talking about that. Um, so I got quite a few of those. And all the covers are, you know, kind of like that. They all have uh, something weird going on in them. So I can't wait to read that. Uh, going back to my heavy metal roots, found a Richard Corbin Den from uh, Fanta, Fantagora Press number one. I'm sure this is from the 80s. Den was in, uh, it's a Richard Corbin owned character that was in heavy metal and he was in the heavy metal movie. Uh, this is from 1988. And Richard Corbin is just on the top of his game when he does Den. Alright. Continuing on with some heavy metal influence. Got some Mobius or Mobius inspired stuff. Uh, I don't think Mobius worked on this, but this is his Elsewhere prints. And Mobius is a French artist. Ooh, got some doubles. Okay. Yeah. And then there's Mobius Comics number one through Caliber Press. This is some of his stuff. Just phenomenal black and white stuff. And Mobius actually, you know, went by two or three names and he had a different style of art. The man was so good he could draw phenomenally in different kind of styles and he went on to if you like the fifth element movie he designed everything in that movie you know the clothes the ships the world everything all right got some epic nightbreed you know uh i'm a fan of clive barker's nightbreed movie there's just something about it that you know the kids went there i was like 18 <coughs> you couldn't buy a comic there without a little fold out coming out of uh, naming all the characters that were in there and Punks from Valiant Comics by Keith Giffen. I was just really curious what this is about. So I have no idea what that's about, but I figured, hey, throw it in the box. Some Harlan Ellison Dream Quarter. Just about done, guys. Just about done. I'll fly through this. And I could not believe I found this. There was only 13 issues of this. I think the first, or 14 issues. 13? I don't know. 13, 14 issues. And the first 11 slash 12 came out through Image. And then years later, the last two issues came out through different companies years apart. So I needed one more, and that was it. I could not believe that's the only leave it the chance they had. This is by James Robinson and Paul Smith. Found a Kirby Genesis miniseries from uh, Dynamite. And this is a variant cover that is a sketch cover. Could not believe I found that. That was cool. Found uh, one of my favorite covers from The Boys, number 26, where they bring in the G-Men. I love how they're doing the Avengers X-Men kind of standoff look there. Or the bad guys of DC, the good guys of uh, DC from the 70s. But they're flipping each other off. Found another boys number one. You know, could not believe it. Found me some room. Barry Winsler Smith. I think this uh, might have led up to the Conan room crossover. Blair Witch books. Apparently they had a mini series, and I have number one. I don't know if it's part of the series, and they were actually really good horror stories. They just retold old tales of Coffin Rock and the, and the witches and stuff, and it, it wasn't like the movie. And they brought in people like Guy Davis and stuff to do some of the art. Found, uh, apparently there was a series of seven, the Brad Pitt Morgan Freeman movie that I love from the 70s. I even did what, you know, What's in the Box recreation when I was snowed in, losing my mind for being iced in my house for almost two weeks, you know. Uh, Battle of the Planets half issue from Top Cow. Going back to my childhood there. Alex Ross was on that. Revenge of the Prowler. Some Eclipse 80s comics. And what is so cool is that this has the record. And I've got a video in it that Tim Truman and his band wrote some songs uh, for the Prowler. You know, so some more Prowler, Tim Truman. I only got exposed to uh, the Prowler in uh, Total Eclipse, which was... Eclipse's comics version of Crisis on Infinite Earths that even had Marvel Wolfman write it. And man, he's a bastard. We're talking like a cool, cool little bastard. So, it'll be interesting to see what's going on with the Prowler here. Uh, then, issue 100 of uh, Nexus came out. And this, I think they gave this away on Free Comic Book Day, but they actually had four issues to make up for the 100th issue, where I think Steve Rude made his big return. These are kind of thick. It's one, two, three, and four. And I think three and four in one book. Part, you know, it's a four part story. You know, to celebrate the hundredth issue, and man, people were going nuts over it. So I was, I was kind of cool. I was like, I need to check this out. Okay, and I was meant to be there. I'm the only person who would buy this. Merciless, you know, the rise of Ming. There's a series telling its origin, a mini series. Powers Bureau number two. I'm a big Powers fan. That's another book where they've announced that I think PlayStation is going to produce a show. Just a Pilgrim number four by Garth Ennis. Love that story. 
Number three is the origin issue, but it's got like mud on it or something. I don't know what the hell. The issue of Stormwatch. Thanks for hanging in there. Fuck your hair, number two. Some Lady Hama and Mike Golden. With the world, number three. More post-apocalyptic stuff. The Dead Kennedys. Unauthorized biography from Rock and Roll Comics. Hawk Moon, a Michael Moorcock adaption from First Comics. That goes with the Eric series. I don't know who wrote it. Gary Conway came in there. And then Silent Invasion, number one. Conspiracy. Uh, the Red Scare, UFOs, everything that was like made the 50s awesome in a six issue miniseries. So guys, as I move these comics so I can turn off the camera, there you go. Thanks for hanging in. I want to shoot another video and just get through all these so I can organize these. Alright.